Amazing. Well, it's been, I mean, obviously the Gemara is always fascinating, but it's a particularly fascinating uh, section that I think we have done this past week. Um, we began a new parak, right? So we're on the fifth parak in Baba Batra, Hamulcheretasvina, right? One who sells a ship. And the Mishnah itself really continues with this topic that we've been investigating for a number of Dapim now, which is when we sell a thing, what is automatically included in that sale? Right? We started off more with questions around land and houses. This parak is engaging that question more around different types of movable property, animals, et cetera. But it's the same basic underlying investigation, which is when I sell a thing, what implicitly is included? Right, When I sell a ship, what, what does one automatically assume without specification would be included in that sale? Right, So that is our Mishnah. And that is what some of the other Mishnah that we see near the end of this past week's content investigate. Um, but in the midst of all this, right, sandwiched by the Mishnah on selling a ship, and then in the last few Dapim questions around acquisition through pulling or giving over, um, how these differ depending on the item, selling wagons and animals, we have several Dapim of deeply strange and deeply fascinating agarita, um, you know, stories that the Gemara has, I, I hesitate to divide it into two different uh, literary sections because I would say there's more shades than that, but there are more halachic based sugyot, right? Ones that are focused on really investigating the laws and really examining the Mishnayot. And there are ones that are various stories and tales, sometimes tales of often the uh, Tanaim, the authors of the Mishnah and the Baraitot, or the Amoraim who are coming in the centuries afterwards. And there's always a really deep question of those who study Gemara of what is the relationship between Agarita, between these stories and the halachic sugyot, the halachic discussions that we see throughout the Gemara. There are times where, and I think that people often who are focused deeply on the study of Gemara, on the study of sort of more halachic sugyot, there's a frequent tendency to sort of minimize a garita, right? That as somebody who teaches Gemara, we generally don't, we often don't teach a garik sugyot because they're an entirely different skill set, right? The skill set that one develops when understanding the structural terms and a halachic sugya back and forth, it's fundamentally does not map that well onto the sort of literary analysis and assumptions about like Near Eastern culture that are required to really delve deeply into a lot of the agarita, into a lot of the stories. But because of that, people often sort of undervalue the way in which this agata being embedded in our halachic narratives is actually meant to like provide some measure of commentary on the halacha itself, right? That in a lot of ways, um, there are some cases where it's incredibly clear when you look at it, that the agarita, that the stories are meant to be a framing device for the legal discussion that it brackets. Part of what makes this parak both really fascinating and frankly really weird <laughs> is that I think it is harder to make that connection with the stories that we see between the document of 73 and 75, right? That there are times where the agata seems so thematically related to the halakhic discussion. Here, the main distinction, this main connection that seems to be made is that our Mishnah talks about a ship and the Gemara is like, well, since we're talking about ships, what if we shared some stories about sea travel and monsters and strange and magical things? And so we get several really wild and trippy dapium of like really intense stories, a lot of them based in the sea, not all of them, a lot of them based you know, focusing on monsters or monsters is a loaded term, but like massive, strange sea and land creatures, uh, you know, the Leviathan, you know, very fat geese, waves that are trying to drown people, angels of death, uh, you know, sites in the, the Sinai desert that, you know, various important things in Hamash happened, um, the sort of Future Rabbi Bozma, I'm so sorry to derail you. Um, I just just a quick reminder to try and 
use English terms as much as possible. So like Leviathan, for instance, Leviathan, it, as much as you're possibly able, so we can be as inclusive and pos as possible. I know that like reflexively, a lot of people just use the Hebrew. Really appreciate that. Yeah. So the Leviathan, who is like the great sea creature that's mentioned in uh, the Bible many times. Um, so we get a lot of in-depth stories about them. And we have also these mentions of sort of future skies, prosperity of Jerusalem, things that will happen in the world to come. It's a really fascinating array. And so what we're going to look at today, I'm going to share a link to this uh, source sheet with all of you. We're going to look at just the very first, you know, section where these stories are introduced primarily. And the way that some of the different commentators uh, from across really spanning the centuries engage with this series of strange stories, right? That you have commentators with really different sort of approaches to how they engage Gemara in general, and especially how they engage these stories within the Gemara. So we're gonna look at this little section and we're gonna see how do some of our different commentators, some of the Rishonim, who are the rabbis up before the 15, uh, 1500s and the Achronim in the time since then, how are they engaging with this material? How are they explaining it? Um, so if people, are people able to see the link that I shared? Would it, I can share my screen if useful. I also am able to see people more easily without sharing, but if it would be helpful, then happy to share for everybody. Then you don't have preferences. Go ahead and share in case people don't want to have multiple screens open, if you would, please. Sure. And um, folks also have the link so they can they can choose their favorite screen arrangement for themselves. Wonderful. Thank okay. you. Okay. So we have this first section, right? So again, this is where we first introduce this very long series of tales. And so on 73A. We have Raba said, seafarers related to me that when this wave that sinks a ship appears with a ray of white fire at its head, we strike it with clubs that are inscribed with the names of God. I am that I am, Yah, the Lord of hosts, Amen, Amen, Sela. And the wave then abates. Right? So this is the way that we were introduced to a lot of the uh, strange and mystical tales of the seafarers, right? That we have these massive waves seeking to drown ships with mystical white fire at their head and we just beat it back with oars um, that have Hashem's name and apparently that is successful. So the first commentary that we see here, Ben Yehoyada, um, he introduces, he really focuses on sort of mystical and narrative interpretations of the Gemara, right? As opposed to uh, a lot of commentators who are obviously deeply focused on the halachic legal exposition of the Gemara, Ben Yehuda is primarily focused on the narrative and sort of these story-based explanations. So we'll see what is his approach to this whole section. So he quotes the first line, this wave that sinks the ship appears the ray of white fire at its head. It's known that all of these statements or incidents were not spoken according to their simple meaning, but rather they are parables. And even when there are matters in them that could occur in reality, despite this, all of them were only spoken as parables and puzzles. And they are what's referred to in Proverbs. For understanding, proverb and epigram, the words of the wise and their riddles. Right? So Ben Yehoyada is giving you a framing device at the very beginning. He says, I know what we're about to read is pretty strange. Some of them, theoretically, elements of it could be explained more according to their shot. Most of it couldn't be. And very few of the rabbis are just saying, ah, yes, all of these things definitely happened exactly as they're being stated. And they're just sharing with you stories because they wanted you to know, right? That we'll see that basically none of the commentators take that approach. That the assumption seems to be, um, there is something going on here. There is something beyond the surface level, no pun intended. Um, and so what is it? How are we digging into it? And the rabbi, like Ben Yehoyah says, it's parables, right? There's going to be deeper, more of esoteric meaning behind each of these stories. Since he is someone who engages a lot in Kabbalah, we'll see that for him, the sort of esoteric meaning is generally very connected to often 
more like Kabbalistic explanations. So I included just like a little chunk of his initial explanation to see uh, how he engages these stories. He says that the seafarers are learners of the Torah, right, who descend to the depths of the oral Torah. And that the wave is the Yetzer Hara, right, the evil inclination, uh, which tries to sink ships, right, it tries to overwhelm the body of a person. And he says, what is it, this white fire at its head? The white fire is the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, sort of initially appearing as something more benign than it is. Right, the real Yetzer Hara appears as a red fire or as a black fire, but initially, sometimes it appears to you as a white fire to sort of deceive a person. He gets into various conversations about the klipots, which again is like these sort of. I, as a non Kabbalistic expert, don't want to state things too uh, definitively, but various elements of sort of evil that exist in the world due to the like shattering that initially created our universe. Um. So this is one explanation. Before we continue, I'm interested in people, you can either raise your hand and speak or mention in the chat. Is Does his explanation resonate with you? Not even necessarily this one about the seafarers, but the notion of these as parables. Is there something else that sort of initially stuck out to you when you read these sections? Like, how were you initially interpreting them? Were you just like, this is fun? Was there a sort of like methodological approach that stuck out to you? chat love them yeah they're incredibly fun if folks like, want to raise your hands that's also fine i i can keep an eye on the um on the participant list here for raised hands they were quite wild weren't they and it's a really long section the psychologist might postulate kids imagine monsters to name and start to control their fears and anxieties Right. This is really fascinating, right? Sages maybe are like naming some of the most scary and cataclysmic things going on around them. Um, right. Sort of, I, if I'm correct, Lynn, this idea of almost like taking the horrifying and traumatizing things that are occurring to them in real life and sort of manifesting that or articulating that in the language of monsters and scary creatures. Um, Daniel, do you want to speak? I just want to say I thought your your uh, rabbi your your initial comment that there's two different uh, ways of thinking about two different kinds of of Talmudic content. Um, I, I'm I'm fine with studying the legal aspects, but for me, our history, our legends, our myths, being able to to attach to what these folks. 2,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, were thinking and how they perceived their fantasy world tells me a lot about Jewish history. It makes me feel more Jewish to read these. Uh, there, there are so many stories out there that that have no Jewish content, and to see this and read this and listen to it and study and and reinterpret it over and over and over again, every generation, to me, that's what it's all about. So thank you very much. Of course. Yeah. And I think that it's incredibly real. I think that the the combination of Agata of these stories with our halakhic disputes, I think lends so much more texture and character to the rabbis that we spend all this time with. It makes it much easier to really delve, yeah, into their psyche, into their world, into their imaginative world, into the actual stories, what's happening to them. Um, it makes it a lot more real and textured. Uh, Carol? Um, thank you, Rabbi. This is really fascinating. I, I do agree that they these stories read as parables. Um, and also, I kind of have this image of the rabbi sitting around when they first started, as you said, talking about ships. They said, oh, yeah, that reminds me of this story and kind of entertaining themselves. I mean, it's hard work to teach all week. And maybe this was a time when they could relax and tell stories. But I'm wondering, um, I get that part in that context, but why do you, what do you think the editors of the um, Talmud were thinking when they included them in this way? Because since they are parables, they could, it could scare people or think, well, that's what we're up against. 
and how tempting the evil inclination is. You know, I, I'm lost. I can't do it. So what? why are they included? That's the so, question for you. Thank you. I think that's an incredible question. And I will try and answer with a level of humility because I cannot speak for the stomach and the anonymous editors of the Gemara. Um, I can give my own thoughts or theories that, I mean, there's a lot of, like in general, the Stamaim, the editors of this Gemara seem to generally include most of the Amoraic material, most of the material that the things, the Talmidei Chachamim, the things that the teachers of Torah in the centuries after the Mishnah taught, I think we, to, in the centuries since then, have created a much more rigid divide between legal discussions and narrative discussions than they understood to exist back in the day. And so for them, like this too is Torah, right? Not to appropriate that phrase, but like they, it's not just like silly tales. They're saying, these are stories that are more aim. And part of our interest in compiling Gemara is to sort of jumble all of these things together, is to say that these are all of significance and they create some measure of coherent whole. The question of like, are we concerned that it's going to scare people is I think a really fascinating one. And one that there's an inherent limit to what we can really know coming from our current context. It, there's a limit to what we can know about how people hearing or learning these narratives you know, centuries or millennia ago would read them, right? How that would hit for them, right? The things that are either scary to us or strange to us, the extent to which that would still be true for people a millennia and a half ago is, is harder to know, especially not as a, an expert of sort of Near Eastern mythologies and narratives. But I think it's a really good question. I think there's also an element in which sharing the things that are scarier but ultimately if you look at the stories a lot of them are narratives of some measure of triumph if not all of them that there is an element of both there are like massive powerful and scary forces that exist in this world and they're also wondrous right there are also incredible things that exist in this world that inspire awe um that really show like hashem's majesty and that can also give us this measure of like inspiration that there is the capacity to, to deal even with the wondrous and terrible. Somebody else mentioned, yeah, the Chumash itself is a mixture of story and law. There's also, if anyone is interested, I can, I can type this in the chat. There is a book that came out a year ago called God's Monsters, Vengeful Spirits, Deadly Angels, Hybrid Creatures, and Divine Hitmen of the Bible um, that gets into... The, the monsters, as the name implies, that exist throughout Chumash that are often through these throughout the Torah that are sort of often minimized in our in our tradition. And what does it mean that God has these monsters? What does it mean that God is often described sort of narratively in ways that map onto monster lore? Um, so I'll just type that title. I would highly recommend. It's a really fascinating exploration. Um, and for now, have, oh sorry. I was gonna I was gonna add two cents if that's all right and get your response, Rabbi Botsam, but now may not be the best moment. Go for it. So I was I was wondering, I had two thoughts about this too. One is that um in antiquity, we think in terms of books, but I wonder if antiquity people thought more in terms these these sort of omnibus collections were more like libraries, right? Uh, the Tanakh, the entire Hebrew Bible, is not is not really properly described as a book. It's a library. It's a library. And then within the books also, and I think another thing that is a modern care category we sometimes shouldn't retroject on antiquity is genre, right? We, we think uh, in our modern publishing landscape that books fit into various genres and I should expect a consistent genre throughout whatever I'm reading. And understand that genre, and I wonder, and I, and and this really is just a wonder, and I'm curious what other folks think. If if maybe in antiquity, when people didn't have lots of books, right? They you might only have one book. You know, they're very very expensive that the community owns. That there is less of a concern about creating a book in a certain genre, and more of an impulse to let it be an omnibus and let lots of important things go into it that don't all neatly fall under any particular genre. I'm curious what you think, Rabbi Botsam, and anyone else who, who thinks about that. That's just speculation on my part. No, I think that that's an accurate reflection also of the fact that to describe Gumara as one genre, right? To describe all of Shas, the entirety of all of the Gumara as being one, one genre, I think, 
you know, would sort of defy modern literary conventions, right? That it is, I think people often try and fail because I, I agree that I don't think it's sought to be that, right? And somebody else mentioned that it is like a collection of this whole array of oral content that is understood as being related, that is understood as having deep wisdom, that is understood as being sacred, but that is not understood as like falling into one neat genre in the way that we often talk about those today. Somebody else also mentioned that I think there is more porous borders between how we understand some of these different genres back in the day than we often um, sort of more rigidly define things as like either legal content, narrative content, right? Like myth as being separate from fact, right? Whereas I think that there is a lot greater fluidity um, between those things as not being like, you know, two opposites, but in fact, deeply intertwined. I am, there's so much more to say. I'm going to pause here just because there are some other deeply fascinating commentaries um, when it comes to approaches. But if we have time in the last couple minutes, we will hopefully take some more questions or comments and also feel free to continue messaging in the chat. This next bit is from the Ritva, uh, Rabbi Yom Tov Asivili, who existed in the 1200s in Catalonia. And he has, uh, a related, but I would say very different approach to what we saw in the Ben Yehoyeda. So the Ritva says, okay, he quotes from Rabbah, seafarers related to me, etc. There are in the incidents related in this chapter, very strange matters for people who are not used to them. And their matter is very close to those who know their nature, like the size of fish in the sea or the size of the waves. And there are also amongst these incidents hidden or hinted at matters that one does not see with the eye, but rather in the vision of a dream. This is because when the sages would travel along the ocean and see the wonders Hashem created there, and these sages would also isolate themselves and do deep contemplation on wonderful and remarkable matters, at the time of sleep, matters that are on their mind would appear to them in miraculous form and provide insight on the issue at hand. The Gaonim wrote that everywhere it says, I saw this, it's referring to in the vision of a dream while they were traveling on the ocean. And since there are liars who slander the words of our rabbis, We'll discuss and hint at some of these matters, including some of the hints that are closer to the shot of the words, right? So the Ritva understands this, even, even our stories, he understands as a sort of compilation of different things, right? That some of these he sees actually, and we're about to see in his specific commentary, stuff that seems uh, supernatural is actually just an exaggerated telling of like real natural events that occur. And some of it is just dreams, right? That like you're out at sea, it's a wondrous and scary and strange place. The rabbis are like deep in thought and contemplation. And you have weird dreams that sometimes like inform you vis-a-vis -vis the questions that you're wrestling with. So the Ritva is also very clearly based off of this last line and something we see with other commentators as well. They're worried even at the time, and you know, this is coming some centuries after the Gemara, but also, you know, almost a millennia before we exist now, he was worried that people are going to see this and be like, ah, this is silly and nonsense. And the rabbis are a bunch of liars, right? And so like these commentators are very concerned with trying to explain to people that they shouldn't use these fantastical tales as an excuse to like deride the rabbis or think that they tell sort of nonsense just for fun, right? That there is like truth and deeper meaning to all that they're relating. Um, so to get a, a taste of what he means by, oh, some of this is just natural matters. You know, we had a bit where it said, ah, between each wave, there are 400 parasangs, which is a very large measurement of distance. It says, this means it appears to the eye there is such a distance between them. And these parasangs are referring to a naval parasang, which is 1 20th the size of a parasang on land. Right, the Ritva is like, this wasn't, no one was actually measuring the waves. They're just describing from the boat, what did it look like to them? The waves look massive. There seemed to be incredible distance between them, right? And the height of a wave is 400 parasangs. Again, that would be a many miles high wall of a wave. It says, it goes up and down and back and forth along the waters in a way that amounts to this much before it eventually quiets down. Right, Not that there is one tsunami-like wall of wave that is this tall, but that it essentially sort of amounts to that height while it is still active. Does that seem like the most shot, the most intuitive read of that statement? Maybe not, but the Ritva is very invested in saying, 
a lot of these explanations, ones that can't be dismissed as appearing in a dream, are ones that do map onto the natural world. And if you think that it doesn't, you're just misinterpreting what they're saying, right? So this is a bit different than Ben Yehoyada's explanation where he's really, with every section, interested in explaining a sort of Kabbalistic, esoteric underlying meaning. The Ritzva thinks some of it has a sort of esoteric background and some of it is either dreams or just explanations of the natural world that are explained in fantastical language, right? So we won't look at all of the rest of these things inside since we only have a few minutes left and I want to have time for more discussion. The Chidushe Agadot is a compilation of the Maharsha uh, who is existing in the 1600s. He's a fascinating example of the ways that he has a Chidushe uh, Agadot, his Chidushim, his thoughts on the stories in the Gemara and Chidushe Halachot, his commentaries on the Halachic discussions in the Gemara. Right, so the Maharsha was one of the first commentaries explicitly focused on the stories. But he also, like he understood these as being related literatures. And so he both felt the need to have separate commentaries, but also to write a commentary that encompassed the entirety of the sort of content in the Gemara, right? So he reads these also as parables. He reads the waves as uh, metaphors for all of the nations that try and drown and overwhelm Israel. Right. And that, you know, the people of Israel are like the the sand of the sea that the waves are trying to like swallow up, um, that the waves in the story where one wave says, I tried to swallow the world and I failed. And the next wave is like, well, I'm going to try. He sees that as like a parable for how all of these nations keep rising up against Israel and not learning from the one before it, that Hashem would destroy them. Right. So he is also really leaning into this from a position of parable. But unlike Ben Yehoyada, who's really focused on a sort of more Kabbalistic explanation, the, the Maharsha, and we see that he continues this reading throughout the several pages of Gemara that these stories encompass, is reading it as sort of parables for the people of Israel, right? Rather than an individual struggle, it's a sort of about these like collective struggles that are mapped onto our material world or monsters, right? Finally, we will look at the Rashbam, and then we'll have a few moments for discussion. Um, the Rashbam, who is the main commentator on Baba Batra, because his grandfather Rashi died uh, tragically, 27 Dapim into the Gemara, he quotes this beginning and says, all these incidents, which are included because of Marabu Masecha Hashem, how great are your works Hashem. Some of them are to inform of the great reward for the righteous that will come or to explain lines in the book of Job that speak about massive birds and animals and fish, as all discussions of Talmidei Chachamim require study. Right, so the Rashbam, who is generally a very practical person, right, because we see this appear in his commentary on the Torah as well, he really believes in very tangible, specific, clear explanations of things. He says these are included to talk about the wonders of Hashem's creation, to talk about, you know, things, the reward of the righteous in the world to come, and to explain some of the fantastical things that we see appear in Tanakh itself, right? We talk about massive birds and beasts and whatever. So the Gemara is like, yeah, let's expand on that. What do these massive birds look like? What are these massive fish? Um, Slurish Bum, he goes through, and for the rest of these dapium, he doesn't really explain it like mashal. He doesn't explain it as parable. He's like, I'm going to explain the words to you so you know what's happening. And he doesn't really feel the need to give a deeper meaning. He's like, I will tell you what these words mean and you can sort of figure it out from there. So while there is more to be said, since it is 10 now, we will pause. But if anyone has sort of final thoughts or questions, please either share in the chat or raise your hand. One last thing I will also say is that we see the Tosafot. People might be familiar with the Tosafot. Um, these medieval uh, rabbis, most of them descendants of Rashi in France and Germany, who are engaged again in deep analysis of the Gemara and often legal discussions, where they use the story about the the Arab traveler leading them to the bodies of the people who died in the desert and passing under the knee. And they use these discussions to arrive at like linguistic and halachic conclusions. 
they're like, ah, we know from the fact that it says that the traveler passed under his knee, that this particular word means somebody lying face up and not lying face down, like Rabbi Hananel said, because otherwise the knee wouldn't be propped up and he couldn't pass under it, right? So whereas we have these people who are invested in like giving these sort of esoteric narrative explanations of all of the stories, the toast voter are like, yeah, what are the legal conclusions I can draw from these stories about like the massive bodies of the people who died in the mead bar, right? This can tell me something about what words mean and what legal conclusions we draw about how we bury people. So okay. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Uh, today, if nothing else, was a reminder that even when you think you are just faced with 20 pages of what is included in this or that sale, right? If I sell this, is it, does it also include that? And if that was fatiguing you a little bit, this is a reminder that when you're in the Talmud, you never know what is around the corner. So uh, we will continue our journey tomorrow morning and it will be in your inbox at 5 a.m. Eastern as always. And in this space in exactly a week, whatever time it is for you in your time zone. Thank you, Rabbi Botsam, for a wild romp through those texts. Thank you to all of you for your thoughtful and interesting comments in person in the chat. And uh, thanks for being here and we'll see you all soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for learning.